Okay, hello everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mark Bollinger and I'm a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, thanks for joining me for today's webinar in which I will run through highlights from the 2019 edition of our Utility Scale Solar Report, which we released back in mid-December. This is the uh, seventh year that we've done this report, and I would like to thank the Solar Energy Technologies Office at the U.S. Department of Energy for funding this work. Uh, before I get going, there are just a few things to note. Uh, first, I will try to save some time for questions towards the end of the hour, so uh, please do feel free to type your questions into the uh, Q&A box at any time, and uh, then I'll try to get through as many of those as I can, and, and if for some reason I can't get to your question, I will uh, endeavor to follow up via email uh, after the webinar. That Q&A box is probably also the best way to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. I do have a, uh, a colleague monitoring the, uh, the Q&A box while I'm presenting, and he will try to help you out if you're having trouble. Uh, finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website within a few days. So with uh, that out of the way, the impetus for this annual report series is that the utility scale solar market in the U.S. has been growing rapidly, generating an increasing amount of empirical project level data that are ripe for analysis. So what we do every year is to gather up as much of that project level data as we can and then analyze it with the goal of identifying key trends in a variety of areas. So today I'm going to start off with just a few slides on the overall U.S. solar market focusing primarily on market size and the utility scale sector's relative contribution to the market over time. Uh, but then for the remainder and really for the bulk of the presentation, I'll focus exclusively on utility scale PV projects since they make up the vast majority of the utility scale solar market. Uh, the report itself does cover uh, uh, CSP projects uh, concentrating solar power, uh, concentrating solar thermal power projects, excuse me, uh, but as most of you probably know, there hasn't been a whole lot going on in that, in that part of the market recently. And so in the interest of time, I'm going to focus just on utility scale PV today. So uh, with an eye towards PV, um, I will present empirical trends in deployment, technology, installed prices, project performance, curtailment, PPA prices, and the levelized cost of energy, uh, battery storage when paired with these PV projects, wholesale market value, and finally, capacity in, in uh, the interconnection queues across the country. So taking a quick look at the overall solar market in the U.S., uh, here we see the deployment history of solar going back to 2007, along with projections out through 2024 from Wood Mackenzie and SIA. Uh, utility scale solar, which is shown here in blue for PV and orange for CSP, has been the largest segment of the overall U.S. market since 2012 and is expected to remain so through at least 2024 uh, with, with roughly 10 to 12 gigawatts of new utility scale capacity projected annually. Um, and I should note, because I see, it, see that I haven't yet, um, that for purposes of this report, we define utility scale to mean any ground-mounted project that's larger than five megawatts of AC capacity. So we're excluding rooftop projects, as well as any project that's under five megawatts. Um, if you're interested in these smaller projects, we do cover them in a companion report series called uh, Tracking the Sun, which can be found at trackingthesun.lbl.gov. So here's another way of looking at historical solar deployment, uh, in this case placed within the context of additions of all different types of generating capacity to the U.S. grid. So in 2018, uh, solar was uh, the second largest source of new capacity added to the grid behind natural gas and slightly ahead of wind. Uh, 2018 was also the sixth year in a row in which solar, including both utility scale and distributed solar, um, accounted for more than 20% of all new capacity added to the grid. So clearly, solar has moved beyond its, its one-time uh, niche status to become more of a major player in the power sector. And as a result, a handful of states now exceed 10% uh, solar market penetration, with California approaching 20%. The numbers do vary a bit, and the relative state rankings also shift around a bit, depending on whether you calculate solar penetration as a percentage of in-state generation or of in-state load. But in general, these are the top 10 states in the U.S. in terms of solar penetration. 
Uh, the relative contributions of utility scale versus distributed solar also varies from state to state. Uh, so for example, most of Hawaii's solar penetration uh, comes from distributed solar, <clears throat> whereas most of Nevada's comes from utility scale solar. Okay, so with that bit of context on the overall solar market, I now want to uh, turn to and focus exclusively on utility scale PV projects, which again account for the vast majority of utility scale solar capacity in the U.S. And uh, once again, as a reminder, our sample of utility scale PV projects is limited to ground mounted projects that are larger than five megawatts uh, of capacity in AC terms. So here we see the locations of all of the projects in our sample through the end of 2018. These 690 projects that total 24.6 gigawatts of AC capacity are spread among 39 US states uh, with a notable concentration in California in the southwest as well as along the eastern seaboard. Uh, there's a mix of tracking and fixed tilt projects shown here, uh, but as I'll show you in a few slides, uh, tracking has become much more prevalent uh, and is almost the default, uh, the default mount type these days. Here's the same map, but in this case focusing on uh, just the 93 projects in 28 states that came online in 2018. Uh, um, these uh, 93 projects total about uh, uh, four gigawatts of solar capacity. The red circles that you see here show that uh, four of these states, Washington, Wyoming, Vermont, and Connecticut, uh, all northerly states, of course, uh, each got their first utility scale PV project in 2018. Uh, Florida added the most capacity of any state in 2018 with about uh, a gigawatt, followed closely by California and then Texas. Uh, the map also shows the location of uh, PV plus uh, battery projects added in 2018. Um, these these uh, hybrid PV plants are becoming much more prevalent and I'll present some more data on that trend a little bit later. Okay, so whereas the maps here show where these projects are located, uh, this bar graph on the next slide shows when the deployment occurred in various regions throughout the U.S. Uh, from the first, from the very first project uh, built back in 2007, all the way up through 2014, uh, deployment was heavily concentrated in California and the Southwest, where the solar resource is strongest. But starting in 2015, and then uh, increasingly thereafter, the market is really uh, begun to expand outside of those two regions into less sunny parts of the country. And this is a function of costs coming down to the point where utility scale PV can pencil out in regions with less insulation. Uh, in fact, here on, on slide uh, <clears throat> 11, we see that trend more directly. Uh, rather than using geography or regions as a proxy for solar resource quality, here we observe it directly by showing the median long-term average global horizontal irradiance, or GHI, among project sites built in each year. So as you can see, uh, average site quality peaked among projects built in 2013 and then has uh, declined ever since with some stabilization among projects built in 2018. Now this is not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing as it reflects solar's increasing ability to compete in less sunny regions of the country. So it's not a bad trend, uh, but it will uh, nevertheless have a negative impact on average capacity factors, as I'll show a little bit later. Uh, it's also interesting here to look at the breakout between fixed tilt and tracking projects. Um, fixed tilt projects, which are the dark blue triangles, have now largely been relegated to less sunny sites and you can see that particularly by focusing on their 80th percentile values, which have declined uh, considerably in recent years. Uh, meanwhile, projects uh, using single axis tracking, which are the red squares here, uh, have been pushing into those same lower resource areas as noted by both their median and their uh, 20th percentile values. And here again on slide 12, we can see the uh, increasing dominance of single axis tracking over time. The two different shades of red both refer to projects that use tracking, while the two different shades of blue um, refer to fixed tilt projects. In earlier years, and really up through uh, 2014, the mix between fixed tilt and tracking projects was pretty even, 
but starting in 2015 and continuing thereafter, uh, the majority of newly built projects have used tracking. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, different red and blue shading intensities refer to uh, different types of modules, uh, silicon versus thin film, with uh, thin film primarily consisting of uh, cadmium telluride along with a much smaller amount of SIGS modules. And you can see that, uh, that silicon has tended to dominate over time. Okay, the final technology aspect that I want to highlight before turning to pricing uh, is the inverter loading ratio, or ILR, which uh, measures the DC capacity of the PV array relative to the AC capacity of the inverter, and so is also known as the DC to AC ratio. As you can see in this graph, uh, the median ILR has increased pretty steadily over time from around 1.2 back in the early days of the market to uh, above 1.3 in 2018. This progressive oversizing of the PV array is a way to optimize or maximize inverter throughput as the cost of modules has declined faster than the cost of inverters. Um, oversizing the array can lead to some amount of clipping of production at midday during the sunniest times of the year, but in general, the amount of clip production is uh, more than offset by an increase in production during morning and evening shoulder periods uh, leading to kind of a net increase in capacity factor, at least when you express capacity factor in AC terms. <clears throat> okay, turning now to pricing, this graph shows the median installed price of utility scale PV over time uh, expressed in both dollar per watt DC terms, which is uh, shown in blue here, as well as dollar per watt AC terms shown in red. Uh, we tend to prefer dollar per watt uh, AC, but uh, show it both ways here given that um, uh, others uh, tend to think of costs in DC terms. Anyway, uh, in AC terms, median install costs or prices have fallen by about 70% since 2010 uh, to $1.60 per watt AC in uh, 2018, with the lowest price project in our sample, uh, in, our, in our 2018 sample, at roughly $1 per watt AC. Uh, I want to emphasize that this uh, sample uh, although it's robust, it is backward looking and only extends through 2018. So these prices are not necessarily indicative of projects built in 2019 or uh, currently in 2020. Uh, here's a different look at the distribution of installed prices over time. Uh, as you can see, the, the histograms have both narrowed and also shifted to the left towards lower pricing <clears throat> over time. And they've also become uh, peakier, with the peak also kind of shifting uh, from the right to the left uh, uh, of each distribution within each uh, uh, time period. 2018 exhibits the lowest pricing, uh, pricing spread of any year, uh, suggestive of less heterogeneity and uh, greater consistency in pricing across the U.S. over time. Okay, turning now to project performance. Uh, here we see the cumulative capacity factors of 550 projects totaling 20 gigawatts of AC capacity that were installed from 2007 through 2017. Because we need a full year of data to calculate capacity factors, uh, this sample does not include any projects built in 2018. Uh, the sample ends with uh, 2017 projects. Um, as you can see, uh, the overall range of capacity factors is, is quite large, uh, from 12 to 35 percent in AC terms, and a good deal of that variation can be explained by the three primary drivers of capacity factor that are broken out on this graph, uh, namely the average quality of the solar resource at the site, uh, whether the project um, uh, tracks the sun or is mounted at a fixed tilt, and finally the inverter loading ratio. And the relationships are largely as you'd expect. As you move from left to right, uh, a higher inverter loading ratio typically results in a higher AC capacity factor. And the same holds true when you uh, switch from <clears throat> uh, fixed tilt to tracking and when you move from a lower to a higher uh, quality solar resource bin. There are definitely some individual uh, outlier projects here and there. And uh, some of that might reflect the curtailment of individual projects, which is uh, embedded within these empirical numbers and which I'll talk a little bit more about later. <clears throat> 
Uh, for those of you who prefer to think geographically rather than in terms of insulation, this graph breaks out the same capacity factor data on a regional basis. Uh, the overall rankings shouldn't be too surprising with the Northeast and Midwest having the lowest capacity factors, while the Southwest and California have the highest capacity factors. Uh, you can see the tracking provides more of an incremental benefit over fixed tilt in the high capacity factor regions uh, over on the right than it does in the lower capacity factor regions over on the left. And as a result, we see a lot more um, <clears throat> tracking than fixed tilt projects in those high capacity factor regions, while the reverse holds true in the lower capacity factor regions. This graph breaks out average capacity factor by project vintage or by commercial operation date. Um, you can see a steady improvement from 2010 vintage projects through 2013 vintage projects, and that's driven by increases in all three of the metrics shown here, uh, whether it's average insulation, as expressed by GHI, uh, the prevalence of tracking, or the average inverter loading ratio, um, all of which increased over this period. Since 2013, though, we've seen average ILRs hold more or less steady at around 1.3, while the, uh, the two other drivers, the prevalence of tracking and average GHI, have really moved in opposite directions, uh, resulting in largely stagnant capacity factors among uh, these more recent project vintages. And again, the lower average GHI since uh, 2013 reflects the expansion, uh, the geographic expansion of the market outside of California in the Southwest, uh, which is actually a positive trend, even though it has a negative impact on average fleet-wide capacity factor. Okay, uh, finally, for capacity factors, we've now amassed enough project-level data that we can start to look at performance degradation over time. And as you can see here, uh, there definitely seems to have been some degradation. The, uh, the red dashed line here suggests that performance seems to be uh, degrading at an average uh, rate of around 1.2% or maybe 1.3% per year, uh, which is a bit more than is commonly uh, expected. Uh, I do want to note that we are currently finishing up a separate project that takes a more in-depth and statistical look at the uh, apparent degradation that you see here, and we hope to publish something on that um, soon. But in the meantime, uh, there are at least two important caveats to note here. Uh, the first of which is that we're not looking at an entirely consistent sample from year to year, and sample size uh, does drop off rather dramatically over time, uh, reflecting the relative youth of the utility scale market. Uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, this graph does not attempt to correct for the curtailment of uh, individual projects, which can be significant in some cases. And speaking of curtailment, these two graphs show the history of solar curtailment in both California and Texas, which are the only two independent system operators or ISOs that uh, currently report solar curtailment data. The graph on the left shows the uh, monthly profile of curtailment in both markets. And you can see that uh, solar curtailment tends to peak during the uh, spring and fall shoulder months when load tends to be relatively light, but the solar resource is still strong. Um, the graph on the right, meanwhile, shows the annual history of curtailment. Uh, it's crept up steadily here in California, um, uh, along with um, uh, increasing solar penetration rates. Um, <clears throat> ERCOT, meanwhile, has a much lower solar, penetra solar penetration rate than California, but experienced a, a much greater percentage of curtailment in uh, 2017, and in particular in 2018, and that's due to some local congestion in West Texas that's impacting just a few projects. <clears throat> okay, turning now to PPA prices. Uh, the combination of lower upfront installed costs that I showed earlier and also higher capacity factors has enabled PPA prices to fall rather dramatically over time. Uh, each bubble on these graphs represents the levelized PPA price from a single contract uh, with the size of the bubble uh, tied to contract capacity and the location on the graph indicating the levelized price at the date of contract signing or contract execution. Uh, the price levelization takes into account escalation rates as well as time of delivery factors and all levelized prices are expressed here in, <clears throat> in real 2018 dollar per megawatt hour. <clears throat> 
Uh, the graph on the left shows our full sample of contracts going back to, uh, to 2006, while the graph on the right focuses on just the, the, uh, the more recent period starting in 2015. Now, uh, although California and the Southwest uh, clearly dominated the early years of the sample through 2013, uh, in the past few years, we've seen the market broaden considerably uh, to the other six regions shown here. Uh, and most of these regions are turning in very competitive PPA prices. For example, if you focus on the uh, post-2014 graph on the right, <clears throat> uh, you'll see that with a few exceptions, uh, uh, notably uh, projects in Hawaii and, and also some in the, in the Northeast, uh, most of these recent PPAs are priced under $30 per megawatt hour with several as low as or even under $20 per megawatt hour. Now, <clears throat> 23 of these contracts are not just for PV, but instead are for PV plus battery hybrid projects. And I've, att I've attempted to uh, uh, call out these hybrid projects by shading their uh, bubbles in the graph on the right, but uh, it's admittedly a bit hard to see all of them, and that is in part because uh, these hybrid projects do not seem to be priced at all that much of a premium relative to their uh, PV-only counterparts. So in other words, they tend to uh, blend in maybe a little bit more than you might expect. And I'll talk more about these hybrid projects and their PPA prices in just a few minutes. Here's another uh, slightly less chaotic way of looking at the same PPA price data uh, uh, to emphasize the time trend. The blue columns here show the average PPA price in each year, while the, uh, the markers show the individual contracts. Uh, the green triangles and orange X markers show that many of the higher price contracts in our sample in recent years uh, come from projects located in uh, either Hawaii or the Northeast. <clears throat> uh, despite solar PPA prices being at all-time lows, utility-scale PV still faces stiff competition from both wind and natural gas. The graph on the left shows uh, levelized PPA prices for both solar here in gold and uh, also wind uh, shown in blue. Um, these two markets have been uh, really converging over time as shown by their respective trend lines, but solar is still slightly more expensive than wind on average across the US. Uh, both solar and wind though uh, do appear to be largely competitive with uh, even just the fuel costs of existing combined cycle gas fire generation. Uh, specifically, these, these horizontal black dash markers that you see here um, represent the then current 20-year levelized gas price projection made in each of the years shown. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, in recent years here, uh, both the wind and solar PPA prices have fallen below these uh, levelized gas price projections. Uh, the graph on the right tells a similar story, but in a slightly different way. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, here on the right, we are looking at the uh, range of gas price projections in each year going forward through 2050, uh, plotted against median solar PPA prices from recent contracts um, over, that, over those same years. Um, in real dollar terms, you can see that uh, uh, gas prices are projected to increase slightly in future years uh, with the range of uncertainty widening the, the further out you look. Uh, whereas for solar, it's just the opposite. Solar PPA prices start out a little bit higher than projected gas prices, but soon fall below the reference case projection in real dollar terms. And this is one way to kind of visualize the fuel price hedge value that solar can provide. Uh, in addition to PPA prices, we also collect enough data, uh, other data about these projects, including CapEx and capacity factor data that I've already showed you uh, to enable us to estimate each project's levelized cost of electricity or LCOE. And that's what's shown here on this graph. <clears throat> uh, LCOE is typically calculated without the inclusion of incentives like the ITC. So uh, that's, what, that's what's shown here <clears throat> uh, by the blue circles and the orange, orange dash markers, which denote the median uh, LCOE. But we can also estimate LCOE including the impact of the 30% ITC. And as you can see by the uh, uh, green dash markers, the median LCOE including the 30% ITC 
pretty closely tracks the median PPA price over time, which is shown by this, this uh, solid black line. And this suggests that the market for PPAs has been <clears throat> pretty competitive over time, uh, which of course is a good thing. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we've also been tracking PV plus battery projects, and this table includes uh, details on 38 of these hybrid projects across 11 different states. Only about 10 of these projects are currently operational. Uh, the remainder are still either under development or, or in construction, <clears throat> but all of these projects have released sufficient detail to uh, merit inclusion in the table. At, uh, four, <clears throat> at about 4.3 gigawatts of PV capacity, these 38 projects represent a, uh, a, just a mere fraction of the more than 55 gigawatts of PV plus battery projects that were in the interconnection queues at the end of uh, 2018. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of information in this table and it's admittedly a bit hard to uh, digest or, or even perhaps read, uh, but I'll just highlight a few things here. Uh, first, the ratio of battery to PV capacity shown here in the second to last column uh, varies quite a bit from a low of 5% to more than 100% in a few cases. Uh, notably, all 12 of the Hawaiian projects shown in the table have sized the battery to exactly match the PV capacity. And this configuration reflects Hawaii's isolated island grid with a very high solar penetration rate, <clears throat> which in turn uh, creates a significant need to uh, time shift a large amount of solar generation away from the midday and into the evening and nighttime hours. Uh, there are also a, a few storage retrofits shown in the table where a battery has been added to an existing uh, standalone PV system. And I expect we'll see a lot more of that kind of thing uh, going forward. The final column <clears throat> in the table shows the uh, uh, levelized PPA price of these hybrid projects um, in those cases where there actually is a PPA and where we actually know the pricing. Um, on the next slide, I will uh, graph these prices and talk a little bit more about them. But here I just want to note that uh, these PPAs have taken several different approaches to compensating the storage component. Uh, in some of the early contracts, the price for storage is simply bundled into the overall price on a volumetric or dollar per megawatt hour basis with absolutely no time differentiation. Uh, more recently, We've seen pricing in dollar per megawatt hour terms, but um, in this case, strongly time differentiated to reward delivery during uh, summer critical peak hours, which is presumably when these batteries will uh, earn their keep. Another common approach is to compensate the storage components separately through a fixed capacity payment. And in one interesting case, there actually is no direct compensation for storage within the PPA, but because the PPA price is based on the local nodal price, the project sponsor has an incentive to store solar energy generated midday during lower priced hours and then deliver it later in the evening when prices are higher. And along the same lines, uh, Arizona Public Service has signed a PV plus storage contract in which they'll only pay for energy delivered between 3 and 8 p.m. So there is some uh, interesting experimentation and innovation happening uh, contractually in these early days of, of PV plus battery projects. Okay, as promised, um, here I've graphed the levelized PPA prices from 23 of these PV plus battery hybrid projects. Uh, the top left graph here shows all 23 of these projects. And you can see uh, there that the 12 Hawaiian projects, which are the kind of the dashed gray bubbles there, um, they are priced at a significant premium over their uh, counterparts in the desert Southwest. And while it would be uh, reasonable to attribute this premium to hi uh, Hawaii's higher, higher than average or very high battery to PV capacity ratio, which um, as shown in the graph at the bottom right tends to drive up the uh, PPA price adder for storage. Um, the graph on the bottom left suggests that this actually doesn't really seem to be the case. Uh, specifically, this, this lower left graph compares PPA prices from Hawaiian projects, uh, both with and without battery storage. And you can see that there really doesn't seem to be much of a discernible difference between the two, uh, which is somewhat surprising, but uh, uh, maybe indicative of uh, some degree of 
value-based pricing occurring with, uh, with uh, solar PPA contracts in Hawaii more broadly. Okay, uh, so far I've been talking a lot about uh, uh, costs and prices, but cost is really just one side of the coin with market bet value being the flip side. Because at the end of the day, uh, it really doesn't matter how little something costs if it's worth even less. So for the next few slides, I wanna shift gears a bit and talk about the wholesale market value of utility scale solar. And uh, we can break down market value into two main components, uh, energy value and capacity value. Uh, energy value is simply the product of hourly solar generation and hourly wholesale power prices, uh, in this case viewed across an entire year. Uh, capacity value also relies on solar's hourly generation profile in order to assess what's known as its capacity credit, which is just a measure of its contribution to meeting resource adequacy requirements. Uh, and then we multiply that capacity credit by capacity prices to arrive at uh, a capacity value number. And here in the graph, you see the breakdown of solar's energy and capacity value across all seven ISOs uh, going back to uh, 2007. Uh, the variation in market value from year to year mostly reflects fluctuations in wholesale power prices across those years. Though uh, in California over on the left, the, uh, the, the, the pretty steady decline in value over time also reflects to some extent the effect of increasing solar penetration. And you can see this declining market value of solar in California uh, a bit more clearly once you normalize solar's market value against the average wholesale hourly price in, in each year. Uh, this normalization yields what we call the value factor, which simply indicates whether solar provides above or below average market value, depending on whether the value factor is above or below 100% respectively. And in California, you can see that uh, solar's uh, value factor has uh, plummeted uh, commensurate with the sharp increase in market penetration over the same period. But the good news here is that California's situation um, still seems to be rather unique. And in fact, uh, solar still provides above average market value in most of these other markets. Okay, for this next slide, um, I'm gonna bring cost back into the picture and, and compare cost to value. Uh, as we saw earlier, PPA prices have been declining and the graph on the left shows that in California, the decline in PPA prices, which uh, is this green, uh, these green bubbles here, um, that decline has largely kept pace with the decline in market value as shown by the columns, leaving solar's competitive position uh, more or less unchanged over time. Uh, meanwhile, the graph on the right uh, shows that in 2018, uh, ERCOT, SPP, and PJM in particular all offered superior cost, uh, a superior cost value trade-off uh, compared to um, Cal ISO or California. And this could be um, uh, one of the reasons that we see the market kind of uh, broadening out and shifting away from California and into these other regions. Okay, switching gears once again, um, I'm going to wrap this up now with a bit of a look forward. Uh, at the end of 2018, there were a whopping 284 gigawatts of solar uh, making its way through the major interconnection queues across the country. And nearly half of that amount, or 133 gigawatts, first entered these queues in 2018. Uh, the strong showing firmly cemented solar's leading position within the queues ahead of both wind and natural gas. Um, notably, at least 55 gigawatts of the solar capacity in these queues is paired with a battery. Uh, that's what's shown by these uh, cross-hatched cross areas. So expect to see a lot more PV plus battery hybrid projects being built in future years. Uh, meanwhile, this next graph shows that the uh, 284 gigawatts of solar within these queues is broadly distributed throughout the country uh, with strong growth exhibited in, in just about every region here, and in particular in the Midwest, which uh, jumped from sixth place at the end of 2016 to first place at the end of 2018. And you can see here that um, uh, more than three quarters of the PV plus battery capacity within these queues is located in California and the Southwest, 
uh, which of course are two high penetration markets that are grappling with so-called duck curve issues that can be at least partly alleviated by uh, battery storage. Now, of course, not all of these projects uh, will ultimately be built as planned. Um, having a, a, a spot in the queues is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for bringing a project online. So we will no doubt see uh, quite a bit of attrition here over time. That said, even so, uh, the amount of solar growth suggested by these graphs is still pretty astounding. And moreover, the uh, broadening distribution of projects throughout the country really speaks to solar's increasing competitiveness in almost every region. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for calling in. And uh, also, once again, I'd like to thank the US Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office for uh, supporting this work. I also want to very quickly mention that we have created a uh, brief survey to collect feedback on this report. You can see the uh, SurveyMonkey link here in this slide. So if you'd be willing to let us know what parts of the report that you find valuable or perhaps not so valuable, or if you have any other ideas about how we can improve the content or presentation of the material, uh, we would certainly welcome your thoughts via this brief survey. So it looks like we have about uh, maybe 20 minutes left. So now let me turn to your questions and uh, see whether I can actually answer any of them. So let me call some of those up. And again, uh, if you do have a question, you can type it in through the Q&A box. So the first question is, do you have a rough estimate of the difference in cost between tracking PV and fixed tilt? Yes, so I do actually, I have a slide on that. So let me, um, let me, Go forward. I have some extra slides here at the end, and I think yeah, here we go. Here's here it is right here. Um, historically, we did see a bit of a premium for tracking over fixed tilt. Um, more recently, that premium has has pretty much disappeared. Uh, and in fact, you can see in our 2018 sample, uh, tracking on average is priced a little bit lower than fixed tilt systems. Um, we we do think that that is uh, just a kind of a sampling issue. Um, you know, for any given project, it is going to cost a little bit more to mount it on a, on a tracker than it would be to do a fixed tilt mount. Um, but, you know, just given the way our sample shakes out, um, we're, we're uh, calculating, uh, you know, median values for trackers that are just slightly below uh, fixed tilt. So um, I guess, you know, my answer there is we have some data on this, but it's subject to sampling issues. And so uh, I would not say it's definitive. Uh, but I would say that the cost premium has narrowed uh, quite a bit, and that is one reason why we see um, a, a growing preponderance of uh, single axis tracking being used. Thanks for that question. Let me uh, go to the next one. Okay, are you able to, to distinguish PPA prices paid by utilities versus corporate purchasers? Um, we can distinguish those. Um, the problem is, Corporate PPA prices are often hard to um, get good information on, and that is because a lot of those, uh, a lot of those corporate PPAs um, are, uh, th th those contracts are kind of virtual in nature. They're, they're often set up as a contract for differences where the two counterparties agree on a, on a strike price. Um, and that strike price is more of a financial arrangement. And because of that, there are really no filing requirements. Uh, you know, these, these, uh, these counterparties aren't required to file that information with FERC, for example, or, or with the EIA. So we do have visibility into some corporate PPAs, but I would say the, uh, the majority of, of uh, PPA prices in our sample are with utilities. Let's see, the next one. So someone was asking uh, for the comparison of installed cost for wind and solar. Was that including PTC or based on hardware only? And did it include substations or just the generation equipment? Uh, okay, so I, I did not show any wind installed cost data. Um, so maybe this, this question is referring to the, uh, the, the PPA price comparison between wind and solar. And I guess I would just, uh, I'll assume that's what it's about. And uh, let me just say that, uh, yeah, those PPA prices do reflect uh, the receipt of the PTC as well as uh, the ITC for solar. So the PTC for wind, the ITC for solar, <clears throat> and uh, they, they presumably reflect um, all costs incurred by the project. Uh, this is really the way that these projects will earn their revenue, and so they need to take uh, 
all costs into account when um, uh, negotiating their PPA price. Okay, so let me um, move on to the next one. Uh, so this one is about solar plus storage PPAs. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this this one's pretty specific, asking about some specific projects. Um, kind of comparing our estimates for these projects against uh, those that have been published by NV Energy. So these are for some of the Nevada uh, uh, projects. And um, I guess one thing I'll say there is um, there could be a discrepancy here because we look at our PPA prices in real dollar terms, whereas often in, in various utility filings, they'll, they'll be looking at them in nominal dollar terms. And we, we we tend to use real dollars because we look at trends and prices over time, and when you do that, you want to uh, be sure that everything is in the same dollar year so that you're not obscuring a trend um, by uh, including inflation. So um, I guess my answer to that question is probably that if there's a discrepancy, it's most likely due to a real versus nominal <coughs> dollar issue, or uh, we might be using a slightly different discount rate than NV Energy used. So let me go on to the next one. <clears throat> uh, so here's a question about uh, degradation rate. What is contributing to higher degradation rates than typically expected? Um, that That is what we're currently looking into in this other project. And um, I don't know that we're going to come up with a good answer because we're uh, we're looking at pretty high level data for entire projects. Uh, we're, you know, we're not looking at string level or substring level or module level uh, uh, data. Um, one thing I will say is that, um, you know, a lot of the PPAs we look at have, uh, they, they basically publish what they're expecting output to degrade at. And a lot of them are, are somewhere between 0.5% and 0.7% and, uh, per year. So that's considerably below uh, what we're finding. And um, I almost wonder if there's some confusion over um, uh, just module degradation as opposed to, you know, uh, degradation at the, at the entire plant level. So the numbers that we're capturing are for the entire plant. So it's energy yield degradation, including both module level and, and the balance of plant factors as well. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't have a good, good uh, uh, answer or insight into the uh, specific degradation pathways here. Okay, next question. Uh, someone's asking if there's any breakouts on bifacial modules. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, attention paid to bifacial, and um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, many or, or really any such projects in our sample yet. Um, they are coming, and so uh, within the next few years, we will see, uh, I think, quite a few bifacial projects, and it'll, it will be interesting to look in particular to see what their capacity factors look like. But uh, so far, we really do not have any standalone bifacial projects in our sample. Okay, someone asked about uh, whether we can speak to any trends in inverter selection, central versus string, and why these trends may exist. And my answer here is, is no. Uh, we, uh, we, don't, we don't collect data down to that level, so we don't have good visibility into central versus string inverter choice. Uh, so the next one says, let's see, Uh, to what extent have you looked at or considered distribution side or end use site storage as opposed to supply side storage? So just to clarify, uh, we are only looking at, uh, you know, whatever the developer decides to put in. Um, and in most cases, uh, you know, since we're focusing on utility scale projects, um, uh, most, most of the storage that we've looked at has been kind of paired with the plant um, on the utility side of the meter, uh, these are not, you know, behind the meter projects. Uh, are you able to distinguish PPA term links by utilities versus CNI? Um, yes, for for those for those uh, uh, CNI PPAs uh, where we actually do have some good information, uh, we can of course uh, distinguish PPA terms. Um, in general, you hear that corporate PPAs tend to be shorter. In nature or shorter in length than um, than the utility PPAs and um, I would say that we do see that but maybe not to the extent that um, 
uh, you hear, you know, via via the, the market chatter. Um, you know, market chatter is these PPAs might be 10 to 15 years. Uh, we tend not to see uh, contra contracts uh, that short. But that just could be a function of the fact that, um, you know, like I said, we're not, we're not, we don't have good visibility into a lot of these uh, contract for differences, and, and maybe those, maybe those are, are shorter term. Okay, the next one here, oh boy, we've got a lot of, a lot of great questions coming in. Um, what do you believe the WAC is for an average utility scale solar project? Uh, likewise, what do you believe lifetime? Uh, what do you believe lifetime uh, internal rate of return? Currently hovers around for that asset class. Um, yeah, so this is a this is a, a pretty specific question. Um, the WAC stands for Weighted Average Cost of Capital. Um, you know, when when I model these projects, um, I tend to use kind of a high single digit uh, uh, internal rate of return, um, along with uh, debt that is priced you know somewhere around four percent maybe. Um, so, you know, financing right now, financing conditions are, are uh, pretty good for these projects. So those are pretty low numbers, but, um, and it's, it's a little hard to know if, if those, you know, how realistic those numbers are, uh, particularly for the, uh, for the equity on the equity side. Um, that said, it, you know, for some of these projects, we know the PPA price, we know, uh, the CapEx and we know the capacity factor. So you can kind of play around with the, um, uh, with the pro forma model and, and sort of back into what uh, what the equity returns might look like and uh, and yeah I think high single digits um, is in the ballpark of what of what we're seeing and that's that's probably about as as uh, specific as I can get on that question. Uh, there's a question about transmission: Will it become a limiting factor in the growth of the market? Um, it could. Uh, I would say transmission is probably not as as much of a limiting factor for solar as it is for wind, and that's because you can kind of fit in these utility scale solar projects in a wider array of locations. Um, the solar resource tends to be more widespread, and you know because these projects um, uh, sit low to the ground, they don't you know they, they don't stick up five or six hundred feet in the air. Um, you can you can kind of build them in um, uh, closer proximity to urban areas, let's say, where uh, uh, you know transmission uh, might not be as much of a limiting factor. And I'm sure there's been some studies on that, but um, I don't I don't have good numbers on that. So someone's asking about the conversion used for DC to AC megawatts. Was it 1.2, or did you vary the conversion based on the location of plants? So just to clarify, uh, again, uh, this report is based entirely on empirical data. So we're actually not assuming any DC to AC uh, conversion. We're actually just reporting what has actually been built. Um, and uh, what we found, and I, I think I showed a graph on this, is that this DC to AC ratio has uh, gradually increased over time from around 1.2 initially to uh, upwards of 1.3 or higher in some cases uh, more recently. Okay, someone's asking about the uh, value factor. Do we believe that the 10% market penetration corresponding to 100% value factor crossover that we saw in, in Cal ISO will be similar in other markets? Um, I don't have any great insight on that. I mean, certainly you would expect as penetration continues to increase in these other markets that the value factor would decline. You know, where those two, where that crossover point is uh, certainly remains to be seen. Um, you know, one, one positive development here, I think, is is um, is the the big push towards battery storage. Um, you know that that won't solve this problem altogether, but um, certainly it will help to alleviate the value decline to some extent. So um, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, going forward in, in in these other markets, uh, we won't see solar's value decline quite as much as we've seen in the California market. But uh, we'll we'll find out in a few years. Okay, uh, someone's asking, where do we see the PPA price trend line going as the ITC burns off in the next several years? Uh, so we have, we have uh, done some work looking into this, and uh, if you assume that the ITC actually declines down to 10% under current uh, law, then um, we see PPA prices increasing by somewhere around $15 per megawatt hour for solar. Um, that assumes that everything else holds equal. In other words, that assumes 
CapEx kind of stays where it is, OpEx stays where it is, capacity factors stay where they are. Um, obviously, some of those pieces will continue to move. Um, you know, I think most people are expecting CapEx to continue to, to decline. Um, capacity factor could improve further as bifacial comes onto the market. So, um, uh, you know, basically, all else equal, we're looking at maybe $15 per megawatt hour, but um, presumably all else will not be equal going forward. So I'm not sure how useful that, uh, that answer is. Okay, um, someone's asking whether I can give some color on the possible consequences of the large number and scale of projects that will eventually go offline around the same time. Uh, I have I've not thought about this very much, so um, not sure I have a good answer, but I, I will say that um, there is some talk about you know repowering some of these assets, um, even even today when you know assets that have only been operating for uh, you know ten years or so. Um, so I think probably what you'll see is rather than these projects going offline, a lot of them will eventually be repowered. Uh, obviously, module efficiency has improved quite a bit over the past five years or, or more, um, and so you know with the same footprint you can get a lot more power out of these projects and you can also perhaps um, uh, you know, reverse any or, or, or uh, fix or take care of any degradation that has occurred in the interim by uh, just replacing the modules. So I, I'm guessing that's probably more of the scenario that we'll see going forward. Okay, someone's asking about the, uh, the value of solar energy in New England. Um, the value factor slide, let me just go back to that. <clears throat> Uh, seem to be uh, lower, uh, at, at, even though the the, the, uh, the penetration rate was also lower. So yeah, here we go for that one. Um, <clears throat> so the, the question is referring to ISO New England. The value factor is also 100, uh, under 100 percent, even though the penetration rate is a lot lower than it is in California. And basically, what's happening there is um, New England. In, in, well, in New England, the highest wholesale power prices tend to occur during winter hours when we get these really cold, cold snaps. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, businesses and residences uh, use natural gas for heating in New England, and, and uh, the New England grid is also very uh, dependent on gas-fired generation. So whenever we have these polar vortex situations that come through, um, you tend to see a lot of competition for natural gas, which in turn uh, really spikes up the wholesale power prices. Um, because solar obviously does much better in the summer, and in fact in New England in the winter, uh, solar, you know, solar projects are often under a few inches of snow, maybe not generating anything. Um, so uh, because of that, solar is really not able to uh, capture these, these price spikes that we see during the winter months in New England. And as a result, when you look at the value of solar across the full calendar year, um, uh, its value does tend to be a little bit lower than a flat block of power. So that's what's going on there. And um, I think the question went on to ask whether um, we'd expect to see that in other regions. And <clears throat> I would say um, it really just depends on on what the, uh, this, the 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 grid system looks like and when when you see your your peak uh, peak price spikes. Um, in New England, it's obviously not favorable for solar, but in other places, it uh, it, it could be. Okay, um, let's see the next one. All right, someone's asking about distributed storage again, and they're saying uh, because that would solve not only the load factor problem, but may also help with reliability, voltage regulation, and distribution end problems. Could we expand our project to try to collect data on distributed storage? Um, we probably won't do that here because, again, this project does focus on utility-scale projects. Um, but uh, we do have, as I mentioned, we do have um, a companion report called Tracking the Sun that focuses more on distributed solar. And I know as either part of that effort or as an offshoot of that effort, um, my colleagues who work on that report are really starting to dig into distributed storage and starting to collect some good data on that. So. I suspect we will have um, uh, some good data to report on that over the next few years. And let's see, looks like we have one more here, which is great because we're close to the top of the hour. Um, this is more of a general question. Do you know if there's a Canadian equivalent of, of our study? Um, 
I don't know that. I've, I've never seen one, uh, but that does not mean that it doesn't exist. Um, there is some solar, obviously, being or utility scale solar being built in Canada, um, but I've not looked into that uh, uh, very closely. So sorry, I don't have, have good information on that. All right, uh, I think I've gotten to just about all of those questions. So once again, uh, thank you everybody for attending. And if you are willing and able, we would love to get your thoughts via the, uh, the SurveyMonkey link here. So uh, thank you all for attending and um, have a great rest of your afternoon.